point is to know enough about technology to actually get this to finally work. And that's a feat. Uh, and it's actually relevant here because if this ever, uh, okay. I've, I'm so used to touch screen, I stopped touching the screen, it just didn't do anything. So the, the, the subtitle of this is Leaving the Path Behind. Uh, and the key idea is that the internet uh, is all about radical simplicity. You want to get something done, you just connect the two endpoints, and you're done. Um, and you don't depend on somebody in the middle to carry the message like a bucket of grade where you have to explain it. And the term I use for this new environment is ambient connectivity. Because the term internet puts the emphasis on the network itself. And I'm really talking about what we can do at the edge, what it enables. So when you look out from your devices, ambient connectivity it means you can just be connected wherever you are. But to achieve it, we have to turn the model upside down. Traditional engineers are taught about layers, and instead, we're, we're reversing the model. We start with the application, and we use, instead of layers, we have resources we take advantage of. So we can be very simply connected. <coughs> we have all these wonderful devices, medical monitors, fire alarms. So if you're in a hospital, for example, you can be hooked up to all these machines. But if you then go out to Starbucks, what do you do? It could be Starbucks down the street, or it could be Starbucks on Beihai in Beijing. Doesn't matter. Uh, the problem you find is Starbucks demands your law you're calling your lawyers, have a conversation, and your, your watch or your medical monitor is not going to be you know, able to understand all this. So that's the real problem. And I was going to take pictures of Bertucci's and show that instead, but I can't get it from my phone to here because if you notice, we're in a, a, a modern Faraday cage. You, most of us are held incommunicado. We can't get on cellular, we can't get on Wi-Fi. It's very dis disconcerting to be that disconnected. Yet we have all these wonderful devices, like this watch here. This is a full Android computer, and has ra Bluetooth, it has Wi-Fi, but you can't do anything about it. It's with even more radios, yet they're all isolated. Now, we can get things to work. This lion, if you watch recent nature shows, you'll notice the lions are wearing collars with cellular phones. Every lion in the Serengeti has a cellular phone account and a GPS unit. So you can get the things to work, but the Maasai can't do it for their cows because they can't justify buying a cellular account for each and every cow. So this is not a technical issue. We have the technology. And the $6 million man was on how many years ago? But we don't have the economic model to justify six million dollars per person. How many people even remember that? <laughs> You're showing your age. <laughs> so the key thing we need to do is refactor telecommunications. Remember it's two words, the distance and the communications. But what do we mean by communications? Telecommunications, the provider owns the facilities uh, and sells you a service. And that service is carrying telegrams or messages such as this message from one of Alexander Graham Bell's arch competitors, the Wright brothers, announcing their flight. There's a lot of value in each message. You can charge people for it. But the other part of the model is to treat these messages as freight. And it's no accident that the you know, telegraph lines ran across along the railroad lines of the Sprint in Southern Pacific. Sprint is Southern Pacific, is what SP is. Now this was the biggest railroad station in the world when it was opened, South Station. It's half of what it used to be, literally. They chopped off half and they sold it off. So if you go back to the basic model, it's pipes or it's a string. You connect two tin cans. And all, what, what Al Bell did was give us a technology, actually it was stolen from Elisha Gray. That's a separate argument, but, uh, you know, but it's, it's still a local story, but Elisha retired to West Newton. Um, so he extended those to wires. So we have tin cans all over the place on these long wires. I, I mean, can you explain to a kid the idea that you want a phone? Okay, we'll run a wire another 20 miles. You, you lay them ahead of time, but basically this is it. Now, we've gotten better. We've got them all up on poles. We've got them into neat bundles, 3,000 pair bundles. We've even gotten better. You can now get a virtual wire from Verizon with digital phone service over Fios. But internally, there's, you still treat it as if there's a wire. And you want a second number? Well, we'll run another virtual wire. Now, of course, natural process, if you've noticed in this picture, nature is reclaiming that. 
as a tree is going back around the wires. Um, and and we're even better, when we don't have any constraints, we magically put up tracks in the sky. So in the frequencies, I mean, those are simply tracks in the sky. They're just constructs. They're not real. Um, and you know, we, we still think of the it, it metaphor goes the internet is a series of tubes. You have my fly, you can have ten accounts. You have to have a virtual tube for each one. And radio is still stuck in the single hop days. You want to f the fire people? They still just call direct to the tower. Modern technology has been a century, and it really still hasn't had a real impact. Um, and what does it mean? If you saw that sentence in in the blurb, you might have wondered what it means. And when I wrote it, I thought I knew what it meant that basically you don't even need words to get the sense of the message. But then I realized over time, you know, other people might have different interpretations of the word sense of supplies. You cannot really control, even the person who says it has control, but the idea that the provider along the path has control is a strange idea we've had that the provider knows what the quality of service is and these other strange ideas. So what is communications? Uh, you can read the definition, discipline, which studies all this, but basically there are, there are really two unrelated meanings. This does not distinguish, and no, you can't, of course there's no internet server proxy. Who's, oh, I see, there's a URL there. It thought I want to speak to the URL. Silly thing. Um, we're in isolation, come on. Reckon, uh, you notice we're not prepared to be isolated. Uh, so there, there's communication in the sense that people talk, the school of communication. That's where the value is. There's a value in a good speech, value in what you say. And then there's the electrical engineering sense, what you do. There's no value there, it's just a cost. The value only comes when you find something to do with it. Now you can create value by making it scarce, so you have to ransom it. But ultimately, the value is in what we do, yet our entire telecommunication industry is premised on the idea that the value is an intrinsic property of the copper. That if you dig, dig deep into a copper mine, you can find the, the value of the messages that copper will carry. Uh, and the problem is, it's hard to talk about this, but words like communication allow us to share words, but we don't have a shared understanding. We use words like broadband, and how many people, and worse, how many people know what the cloud is? Could, will a computer work on a rainy day? And you know, Pandora is radio. And this is what language, what happens with language, it co-evolves. At one point, radio was the business model that used radios. There was no other business model, so why use two words? Um, but this is why we have to be very aware when we talk. Now, sometimes it's obvious. How many people confuse ergs as a measure of work with what you pay people salaries for? Yet a word like information, we confuse Shannon's measure of bits with the measure of the value in a conversation. They're unrelated. They're no more related than ergs are to the work. Yes, you can come up with complicated theories, but basically, this, if anything, the relation is inverse. Which is more valuable? A terabit for a, an HD movie, or 10 bits to summon a doctor when you're having a heart attack? Yet a business model does not allow those 10 bits through. So we have a lot of implicit assumptions in this model. I'm rushing through a little for the time because we're so late. So we have, we still talk about spectrum policy as if that makes sense. It's a conversation that should have died half a century ago, yet we still try to allocate these tracks in the, the sky. I'm surprised that we don't use the term gauge for the frequency bands and that we have to put ties back in the sky every few years. And there's a wireless internet. It's different than the wired internet. It's like you have the letter E. It's wired and there's a letter E that's not wired. And then interference is simply confusion. It's not a property of the electrons. If everybody in this short room wore blue shirts, I wouldn't be able to tell you apart, but you're all in the same frequency. If I'm that silly, I deserve to be confused. But making that the basis of a policy. So we have a lot of this confusion implicit in our language, in the, in the words, and then these poor policymakers don't know any better. Experts are telling them, sorry, there are only seven colors, but there's seven days of the week. That's why we have indigo you read about Isaac Newton's coming up with color names. So we have an old business model that connectivity is for profit. As if roads were for profit and you close down all the unused roads, or as John Stewart pointed out, we close down the states that weren't profitable enough. No, roads exist to support the community. Sidewalks exist to support the community. Wires exist to support the community. They should, they, today the wires exist for one purpose, to support shareholders. Uh, and one of the biggest confusions is a strange metaphor that using up the internet. How many of you have seen the cartoons? Oh, used up the internet. 
last of it. The last person on the internet is full now. But that is the way we think about it. But why the IEEE is it, it, it is electrical electronic engineers. Bits are not a concept that existed when the IEEE was formed. And so we still have protocols I mentioned like IEEE 1394, which are really the old model. And you, you know, remember bits are not how many people worry about running out of the letter E? Yet, if you're a Comcast user with caps, you worry about running out of, of the number one. And then we use the term access, as if you access the internet out there. But again, strange concept. You're just using a wire. What are you accessing when you access the internet? You can go access a website, yes, but that's not the internet. So we have to get back to basics to understand what's happening. So we have a very simple case we need to think about. How do you turn on a light? You, tell, you can tell a light bulb, we don't really tell a light bulb to provide light, but we actually, it's, you know, do is simply stop starving of electricity. Would somebody please throw the switch? By the way, this, he happens to be my real electrician in real life. <laughs> and he can't even turn a light switch on. Okay, so he managed to turn the light on. Uh, and the real problem is we have the control and the wall, you know, you're done. <laughs> but uh, the strange idea that if you want to move a light, I've got to call him into my house to go smash holes. I mean, his skill is really smashing holes in walls and passing them up again. Okay? And, you know, that's, it's, it's just like we have to run those wires, the tin can wires, all over creation to make phones work. Okay? Uh, it makes much more sense. Okay, turn on. Why is this not quite, okay. So the news, so we just ask the line to shine or we can just turn it off. Oh, I had this upside down. Turn it on, turn it off. By the way, what's interesting about this is that I used to have to talk about a community with light fixture controlling. The bulb actually is the other end. The bulb has radio in it and could get messages over wire. We have these smart endpoints we don't take advantage of. And you know, that, that's an LED bulb supposed to last 25 years with a computer in it, radio, protocols, everything for 30 bucks. Yet we're acting as if we have to have physical switches to control things because, well, that's the way it worked two centuries ago. Okay, less, uh, about Ben Franklin was two centuries ago. So, what we really want to think about is a different world in which we start with relations between endpoints. You don't worry about all the wires between, just like I communicated directly, you don't want to worry about the path. This happens to be direct radio, but, you know, it doesn't have to be. We just, in other words, we think about it as a direct connection, but that's the architecture. We don't have to think about the path. And when we have to think about the path, then things break and become infinitely harder. Uh, so we look at the history of radio packet networks was very important. In the 1960s, uh, there was Aloha Net in Hawaii, which used unreliable radio packet network to uh, exchange messages between computers. You wanted to send a message, you send it to that antenna there, and you would get an acknowledgement back, actually by slow phone wire, um, saying the, the message got through. And if it didn't, your software, everybody knows, see, send it again, big deal. I mean, it was sort of an obvious thing to do. So when Bob Metcalf put it on a coax, we called it Ethernet, um, you know, we just were able to avoid the FCC problems with free space radios, if that's the right term, uh, Tim can correct me. Um, and we just, you know, basically had the whole spe radio uh, wave spectrum on wire. And it turns out today, we don't even need to use carrier sense, but we can use signal processing. But still, in those days, I, and I know my reaction to it. The problem is all the telco people want all these models, you read our Poisson distribution, all this. When I was in class, or if the boss spoke about it, I just wanted to use it. Who cares whether it worked or not? I'll put a package on and see what happens. But these are two very different traditions. And the key thing is, unfortunately, everybody uses the term net. But the word network means anything you want. Social networking or anything. But it gave people the idea that it was a network service provider, and that was wrong. It was just a piece of lump of copper. Uh, so when TCP is basically taking that retry and implementing it as an application that we all use. And you need, but we have access to the raw packets, and that's the essence of the internet. The rest is uh, detail. 
But in order to use it, you really have to think in terms of discovering what works, not rely on promises. Nobody's promising the packets will get through. So now I saw that three point, or actually 2.994, as Bob corrected me once, me megabit uh, path on the coax. Let me try it. See, I see what I can do with it. If it collapsed at 10%, fine, I'll deal with it. But you don't have to prove that it's going to work at 99.9%. .9%. And the irony is, his proofs are all wrong anyway. Worked much better than he proved. Uh, Netflix is an example of this. Netflix works because it works only where it works. Therefore, they don't have to pay a provider. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's it. They're not going to bribe somebody in order to allow passage. But cleverness can extend what works. Well, I got these out of order. So, so but telecom is based on guarantees. Okay, but in order to make a guarantee, you've got to prevent things from happening. If you can't guarantee, you can't allow it to happen, otherwise you're making promises and you're stuck promising something, as we'll see with the thing with ISDN versus alternatives. But, net, but cleverness extends this works. So, whereas DSL failed for competing with interactive TV 25 years ago, Netflix today we can run video over less than, than the, uh, many of the DSL lines. Because we have powerful computers, we have clever algorithms, we have encryption, we know how to do it. So we don't rely, we're not relying on a third party, but we're extending our range by being clever. And the key thing is if you're a stakeholder, you can also extend what's clever. If you own the wire, you can invest in a fat of wire because you're benefiting, not the shareholders. And an interesting real world example of discovery is Google Maps the transport, directions. If you look at them, there are different directions depending on the moment in time. It knows what's happening, sees, oh, there's an opportunity, there happens to be a train running, I'll hop on that train, or at this hour I'll take, and this is out of the other end of Waltham. Opp opp opportunity is a very powerful dynamic. Unfortunately, as people talk about uh, adaptation, the creature, the draft adapts to the tree, no, that's an emergent property from randomly some animals happen to get lucky. So we tend to attribute these things to cause when they're really taking advantage of opportunities. So we don't appreciate the power of opportunity, but we insist that cable TV must work before it can get any internet. We have this absurd term, high-speed internet. Internet came from modems. The only reason we might depend on speed is it works too well. The biggest problem today today's internet, it works too well. So people come with all these magical things that assume it's gonna work. So in order to do this, a discovery is thinking very differently. So this is where the ISDN pots versus copper example. It's not just, so this rule, people know what ISDN means? What? Well, it actually worked. It, in Europe, it caught on. And pots is the analog plane old television network. But there's also, we forget, it's copper. We forget about copper. So ISDN was, was well engineered, but they charged for the added value. Obviously, they should benefit from that. The real reason why we're able, the real reason why they charged is it was too expensive to char to do billing for local calls using rotary dials. So they, so they said, we'll just make a flat rate. Once you get ISDN, billing becomes cheap. So you can now bill. Um, but the thing is, even with ISDN, you, as I point out, you couldn't do voice. It was, I mean, you couldn't do video. It was designed for video. But to make video was so complicated, you, you, you didn't want to promise it would work well. P uh, so POTS, thanks to POTS unmeasured service, uh, it drove the online industry in the way ISDN couldn't in the US. Now ISDN could have offered without the charge, but by then point the game was over and ISDN had other problems. But the important thing about POTS was by the end of POTS, 56 KB modems ran as fast as a ch single channel on ISDN because they reverse solved the codec at the exchange. Basically, the modem designers had full control over one leg of this copper. But what happens if you go to the copper? Well, DSL, even with the constraints of pairs, suddenly went megabits over that same copper wire because the telco controlled both ends. And then 25 years ago, they stopped. 
because of policy considerations, nothing to do with technology. Imagine what you could do with copper with 25 years of technology, especially if we didn't constrain ourselves to pairs. We treat the whole thing as abundantly. didn't care which pair. A pair broke, it didn't matter. The bits will take another pair. Your repair costs go down. It doesn't have to be copper end to end. You could have fiber legs, you could have radius, you can mix and match. We haven't even explored the, the, the possibilities of copper, yet Verizon pissed away no apologies to you, Verizon. Uh, what, 58 billion or 60 billion dollars on, on Fios? Because they, shiny glass was needed to carry bits? And they, of course, in the end they put it over my coax cable and then it all goes to hell. So, so, tell, so we have the codex speed limit. Okay, let's do this. So, the, so as I said, PSTN has a built-in upper bound of 56 KB in the US. So I can guarantee your path will work. Therefore, you can't do the full video because that might not work. And then get a busy tone. I'm sorry, circuit busy, but they can't guarantee you a circuit. Skype doesn't guarantee anything. They make zilch promises. And they give you video in high quality because they're not promising it, but increasing their opportunities. And the reason that works is the web. We have the capacity because of the web. Skype just saw an opportunity and used it. But we also have to stand the power of just bits. All the bits and nothing but bits. Because unlike protocols like Fire, how many people know about Firewire 1394? Really smart protocol. You can go all the way around the world as long as you're not going more than 18 feet. Because the protocol re required echo, uh, uh, not echo suppression, but basically jitter control and all this for HDTV, but they knew memories to board. They built this into the protocol in the wire level. Actually, uh, uh, Firewire is much funnier than that, but that's another story in itself. But all I can say is you put your cameras on it and two computers might see half, half of each camera. Um, USB, same problems. Insteon, which is what I used to turn the light on. All of these, the protocols are in silos that assume too much. Insteon assumes a round trip message in a single interaction. So IP is amazing because it transcends this. Uh, and, you, and the other thing about the internet, of course, you, know, you don't have to explain to the telephone company, I need a new service. You just do it. So we don't worry about path providers. And the path provider isn't even aware of the meaning of the bits. They can't be aware. One example I use is if you say see me in five. They don't know if that's an urgent message, that see me in five seconds because it's a heart attack. Or see me in five weeks, you have nothing better to do. Uh, and, but the path can be perverse if it's second guesses. One of the big problems is buffer bloat. Everybody knows buffering is good. Turns out buffering is the worst thing you can do because it means all the protocols which tr you try to share the medium break. Because everything is... You know, I've got all these friends here. Well, this world is empty. We'll all go there today. Turns out it's not empty. Everybody's behind the wall. So there are the, these are the many perverse things that happen, which were even worse when, when they want to monetize it and sell favors. But we won't go into that part. This is even when they're behaving nice. So Cyclades was an important step in this direction, just a, a little bit of history. Cyclades, what the French pronunciation which I got wrong, which was a transitional network which had used unreliable datagrams to do reliable virtual circuits. The internet took this one step further uh, by, by shifting all the, uh, the uh, creation of circuits to the application, to the machine. So TCP is simply a subroutine library for creating reliable circuits. One of the important parts of TCP is it's a social protocol. Instead of you just jamming things in the network, you figure you have basically a stakeholder along with everybody else, so you'll back off so you sort of can share it evenly. You have a shared fate. And UDP is a protocol when, where, when it's better to have uh, better late than never. I mean, better never than late. So we maintain our illusions, but our ability to, to do reliable over unreliable uh, basically makes it look like the phone company, just another phone service. Obviously, only a phone company can give us a, a telephone service, even though they have absolutely no, no involvement. Even, even Verizon AT2 are getting into the game with a voice over IP service, but then they dropped them because it was very hard to explain why you pay for their expensive service when they had this inexpensive service. But basically, it's, you know, internally, nobody's buying switches, even though I remember listening to a panel of 
communication lawyers, spent an hour discussing the import of, per of, of rules on buying switches. Next panel, most of the same people said, oh, but we're not buying them anymore. So beware that the regulatorium and reality of long parted ways. And, but once you get into the regulatory system of the Federal Speech Commission, it's so complicated, you really believe in reality. It's like going to the Renaissance Fair and forgetting there's an outside. So we fail to see that the internet is a different concept that requires thinking differently. We, we, do, we try to do broadband. We think the problem, the reason we don't have more broadband is because the phone companies, whether they're not the malicious, let's assume they're really kind and everything, they're not stupid. And they're not going to do something that's going to lose the money. The, the economic model of broadband doesn't make sense. It's like being the, the 75th milk provider when they're, you know, the problem is if there's too much milk available, the price drops below cost. It's not a sustainable model. So to understand this, we have to go back to the history of telecommunications, which is the history of the railroads. There's a great book I read on the history of Western Railroads. So the ICC was created, but imagine you've got a high capital expense system in the West, railroad tracks going. No differentiation. So how do you make money? So, this, uh, so for a while, I mean, a, it's a wonderful book, how they scammed the King of England, all these other people who are investing. But ultimately, they couldn't pay back. So they created the Interstate Commerce Commission. Uh, and that became the FCC, uh, which basically is still tracks. But these tracks have a network layer, a data service layer, an application layer. And I, what struck me once was the term that data services is, is, is an added value service, as if it's adding value to the network on behalf of the network provider. So, and the value goes up in this model from the bottom. You're providing value, supposedly, and the money comes down. Very nice model, except the value is not going down. The value is, is staying in the application. Because once you're using pure bits, the provider doesn't know where the va doesn't have any way to get handled that value, so it can't work. That's why you don't see more broadband. Why you have to give people incentive for broadband, and of course they're not using all that copy there, which can do perfectly fine multi megabit connectivity by just changing a few line cards and putting what is now probably a one dollar chip in the CO. But we, but it's not just the bellheads. I don't want to blame the phone companies. The network people who talk about network of networks are just as guilty. They think in terms of pipes. But they have to have pipe providers. And the idea that you need to be on the right internet. Verizon has a nice app, I won't say one phone, but an adequate app, with remote control for Fios TV. But if you're not on the right network, it can't work. Strange concept, you're on the right internet? It was a net one that had the ad, there's only one internet. Why are you paying more? Well, these guys are telling us you're on the wrong internet. There's something wrong architecturally. That if you're on the, if you connect to the wrong access point, you're on the wrong internet. Very strange concept. So we still have these paths we're dealing with. So we have network security and authentication. That's why you have to authenticate to a Wi-Fi access point. So it's much better to control over Wi-Fi, it would seem, than instantly on special protocol. But in order to set up this device, you've got to explain to it, by the way, that Wi-Fi access point, you need to have this magical code to get it. If you move to another room or another access point, it won't work. I mean, what, who's going to put up with such nonsense? No wonder Belkin's not selling many of these. And, we're, and they are clever. I mean, first they do a Wi-Fi direct connection. So you connect to it via an iPad using an app. They don't have an API yet. Then you, you can tell it how to access the other access point. And, you know, at least this is better than most. Usually with setting up a wireless device is even worse. So we've created this twisty passages of this maze. How many of you remember the adventure game with twisting winding passages? We have to play adventure every day when we're dealing with the internet. With the research we have, Genie is trying to solve these social problems inside the network. They want a network smarter. They want to put security in the network. They want to allocate resources in the network. They got it upside down. Yet it's so nice because you can fix problems in the network. You know, it, it, it's like you drop a key, you search under the lamppost for the light is not where you drop the key. And peer-to-peer -peer should be the norm. That's all that matters is the relationship between the two endpoints. Yet we don't have standards for P2P. Every peer-to-peer -peer system is different. 
you know, no wonder we don't have the connected medical device. We don't have connected fire alarms. No wonder all the cows are wandering around while the lions are getting directions how to find them. I don't think, goes, I don't think the lions are listening, though. So more to the point, the value is in the services in what, and what we do with the wires. So more capacity means you can create more services. Problem is that investing capacity for a carrier reduces their income. Because services where the money are, these are service providers. The word they use is service provider. If, you're, if they're creating their own services, if you're creating your own services, they're not making money. That's a problem. No, it's worse. They cannot be differentiated. So you've got all those broadband lines on the poles. If all you're getting are bits, there is no differentiation, and that 1% of one of them you get is all you need. Yet somehow, the system is so dysfunctional that we've got three broadband pipes plus DSL plus the radio links plus all this stuff passing my house. And somehow, we're forced to pay for that huge redundancy without the benefits of resilience. There's something very wrong to pay. So people worry about the cost. We're paying 100 for 100 times as much capacity right out the bat, let alone the capacity we can get with Moore's Law on a single copper wire without any new fiber. You notice in your home, 20 years ago, structured wiring was going to be fiber. How many of you are using fiber network in your home? We use copper. We're running gigabit on copper and 10 gigabits on HDMI. Because the market go, develops the technology where it needs. There are no intrinsic limits we know of to the speed of copper. It's just our cleverness and tools of using it. And this idea of interference makes it seem as if wireless spectrum is scarce. Well, if you just went to the nearest Wi-Fi access point we just opened up and didn't have to shut them all down, we'd have so much capacity available. We don't even have to think about spectrum. We all have to go as nearest feet to the next fiber or copper wire or whatever. Yet we have a system's design. It's sort of as if you're never allowed to change lanes on the highway. The purpose of the system, whether intentionally or not, is to create scarcity so providers can make money. Sort of like airlines with regulation. You know, it's, or maybe, I think, it, it, I think customer service is legal in Germany, but it used to be considered unfair competition. Uh, so for the carriers, the customer is a primary competitor. That's a weird kind of market. So what if we change the model? That we align the incentives by making the customer now a stakeholder. If you, and this is what, when it was Microsoft in the homes, it gave people control over the, the internet connectivity in the home, the wires, really just the wires. And it runs at a gigabit now, but it's people invested. We have a whole set of people selling you gigabit switches for 50 bucks. Now, if you, if you get the telco standard version, it's going to cost you 50k bucks. But that's the shareholder's benefit from that. But it's an increase of the value of the company because service companies need high margin and all that. You need a different kind of company to deal with copper. Uh, but aligning incentive is the key to Moore's Law hypergrowth. You can invest in more people and it drives the cycle very rapidly. When you're not answering to multi these conflicts of interest, you have just one master. Uh, better stuff, cheaper. And you have very easy metric for comparing. More bits, cheaper. Reliability turns out to be a non-issue because you can program around things and everything. I mean, no, it's not a non-issue, but you, you, once you get to a minimal threshold, it is possible to go to Taiwan and find stuff that doesn't work. But for the most part, once you're above a reasonable threshold, it works. And because we are looking for opportunity, we can choose any kinds of success. We're not limited to the one kind of success. That really helps Moore's Law a lot. And then you just iterate. Uh, so, you, so the way to get there is you start for connectivity at the edge. Rather than a service model, you start providing connectivity from your edge. In other words, your home, your campus, whatever, is the internet. The fact that you've accidentally reached something around the world is a byproduct. We have it backwards. We're so surprised you can reach, read a newspaper around the world. You forget, that's just an excellent byproduct. Just like Skype Sky video is a byproduct of the web adding enough capacity so statistically enough packets get through. So the term I used at the beginning was ambient connectivity. So instead of thinking about the network, you think about just what you view from around you. That there's connectivity everywhere. And you just connect. You don't worry about it. Uh, 
it's a very app device centric view. So you just reach out and you can reach anything anywhere. And you don't have to negotiate with anybody for passage. You're in Starbucks, it just works. And it, it, you know, it actually goes further. You don't have to run special wires. You'd like get power to the light and then just glue a light switch on anywhere. Sorry, he puts him out of work. But actually he's using it to, to say, make his life easier too. But his colleagues apparently are upset at this. But it, you know, but it really changes. It. It's not simply that you're saving money on electricians. You can change. You want to move the furniture? Move the switch. You don't have to beg somebody to bash a hole in the wall to move the switch. You just do it. Or you just can Or you don't like a switch? Glue one of these up in the wall. And I could do this. I could turn on the lights in my home from this. But because I knew how to put the scaffolding to make that work. But that should be the norm. But it does shift responsibility. You're now responsible. Things don't work, it's your fault. Fortunately, things work quite well. Too well, as I said. But so much works now, that's not really a problem. But if you try to do telesurgery, and if the connection gets lost, the knife falls down, well, don't do that. You know, don't be, don't be foolish. But if you've got a medical monitor that warns about the heart attacks, if 99% of the time it gets through and 1% it doesn't, that's still so much better than not doing it all that you can rely on statistics. Even if it's 50%, that's, uh, well, it's, it's infinitely better for those, you know, math, it's not 50% better than not being able to do it at all. And more than that, if you have a, a fire alarm, it can do rich signaling now. It doesn't have to go beep, beep, beep and hope somebody would hear it, call the fire department, to maybe find it, it would actually said it's this chemical at this temperature with this you know, analysis. If you want, you'd, you'd have to decide how much information you want. But you know, I mean, if you did have your meth farm, you really don't want to report too much of that. Uh, and, but in, in Dale Grace, with failure. It doesn't get through, well, you deal with it. A lot of it, you prefer the message of the heart attack message, say. And by the way, point it's not just a heart attack. Once you have this information, we're going to know precursors to the heart attacks, but you're going to be gathering information along, uh, over time so that you'll develop a profile. So an hour before, so if the message doesn't get through here and you walk down the street, it will remember to send the message later. There's all such a way cleverness makes up for this. To the user, it seems like connect all the time. In reality, it was sporadic. But the thing about ambient connectivity is it's a geographic coverage. This area I've got ambient connectivity in. But you can't discriminate who gets on and not. But once you need authentication, the model breaks. So it's not Wi-Fi for the city, but it's dense coverage in an apartment house or whatever. And the model for this is sidewalks. Sidewalks we used to facilitate walking. They're not required for walking. So you get to your neighbor, so you can have radios and things you want to communicate with without your neighbors. But if you, if, if you want a lot of capacity, you, you hire people to put in the things to facilitate walking. And you, you, you know, as you said, it's not a consumption metaphor. So you're not worried about somebody using up the sidewalk. And you don't have to exclude people in order to charge. I mean, a communication system is premised on the idea of preventing people from communication, so you have something to charge them for in order to fund communications. I mean, it, it, I, I, you know, it would be a great nightclub comedy routine to explain this to somebody. Um, and the whole idea of easements is because you have private owners taking things from you as opposed to the community. So the key thing is it's funded locally by stakeholders. Now, you have to be careful of the metaphors. Sidewalks are expensive. People are big physical objects getting bigger. But more as well applies. We get more sidewalk if people can communicate more instead of having to walk across town. I remember in the 70s reading Legos. Huge traffic jam, but the phone system didn't work. So everybody was driving across town, but I couldn't phone people to see if they were there, and then they find they were not there, but they were all driving across town. So we have to imagine what's possible. So this is an obfuscated form of the string that could turn on the light in my house. And if we had connectivity, I could just do it from here. And I could connect to the camera to show you the lights going on. It's just, we're disconnected, but it's that simple. I've got a simple URL. I can just do this, puts up a screen. It's that, but I've made it simple. There's no reason why, why more can be simple, but we still need more research. But it's a security model over this. There's so many problems. We're, we're instead, we're putzing around with playing with the network wires instead of solving the real problem. How do you take advantage of the opportunity? What, what are the new trust models? What are the architectural models, et cetera? Connected healthcare is one example I use. 
you put aside all the laws like HIPAA, which make it illegal to do connected health care. Uh, but it's not just, you know, there's so many other, it could be more mundane things. Like, I mean, we're used to some of it. Amazon goes through a lot of trouble, so your book just appears on your device. That should be the norm. You should have a special case with Amazon. We can build new meta devices, which are all these pieces of devices, you know, instead of wires getting the elements of a device, they're made together by relationships. So it's just, just do a situation. Have the, there's the Arduino, 30 bucks for Arduino. Full computer. If you want more, a little more for the Netduino. Or you could put, put a cellular, uh, um, whatever things on top of it, and now that can communicate using a cellular system, which is just another resource. I mean, cellular system is a lousy basis because its primary purpose is billing, and it has to prevent bits from getting through until all the billing protocols are solved. It also has buffer bloat and other legacy problems. So there's no magic here. It's just we need opportunity without all these people along the path second-guessing what we're doing. So it's a very pragmatic approach. You want to make local ownership the norm, as in your homes, if you and your neighbors get together. You and hire somebody to basically do more, just like you do within your home, within a campus, do it in a apartment house, do it in the city community, and you work outward from there. And it's then you buy passage further on. The model is not exclusive. We don't have to change the world. We just have to change your house, just like you change within your house. Uh, you've got, you own the wires, you can own it within the neighborhood, apartment house, whatever. We just don't want to think of a network of networks. We just start to think of what can we do with all the copper, fiber, radios, and all the telecommunication infrastructure that happens to be lying around. And we have to get over our Malthusian fear that we're going to use up the internet. Do you know what percentage of the fiber and copper and everything in the ground we're using now? Anybody? Guess the number? To the first three digits. Zero. Yes. I oh, know, set up in there. Zero percent. No, it's obvious, an obvious answer because if you look at more, if you look at like, I'm using 1% of one of my uh, broadbands, can do all of it on that. That's a hint. But that's be before applying Moore's Law. And that's not including all the, you look at 128, sorry, I-95. Uh, whenever they do an extension or anything to any highway, they put fiber in. There are gobs of fiber, and then there are two, there's just so much of the copper loan, and we're not using any of it. Because that would break the business model of, make, of, of owning copper being a profit center. So we already have the mixed model of local ownership and aggregating further thing. You, all your devices in your home share a common internet connection. Businesses, the whole business will share a connection. And the aggregation cost advantages are huge. Buy dark fiber, or you can pay once and then just use it forever. Better gear, you get more capacity. So you treat all this as resources. So we've inverted the paradigm on the, and realize the value comes from what we do with the resources. They're not intrinsic in the resources. Sometimes we get value by scarcity, but the value, you know, we're not short of the silicon we use to make fiberglass. Copper, yeah, copper's getting pricey, and as much as I prefer to reuse the copper in the ground, it's there, it's lying fallow, we should use it. But if selling the fiber pays for, do, if selling the copper pays for something else, um, I, you know, I don't care, melt down your pennies. Um, but we do have to understand the interplay of economics and technology. Technology is driven by business decisions and economics. Moore's Law stopped in uh, copper 25 years ago. Before that, we went from dial-up speeds averaging throughout the day one kilobit per second or less per wire to a few megabits. And that stopped. Sort of hit a wall. There was an IBM exhibit. Uh, you know, I remember the World's Failure show. The, grab the, the baker was caught with short lows, but she looked at a bell curve. Wherever the inspector came, he got curves above the curve. But if you drew it, you knew somebody was getting the, the bread under the curve. So we can see that Moore's Law worked fine, and then it stopped. Now, Moore's Law is not about physics. As I said, it's about markets. It's people going where the incentives are. So where's the fastest computer in the world? It's in your video board. But it, doesn't, it solves different problems, so you need a different measure of success. So this important thing is to understand that if we prejudge what the answer is going to be, we're going to fail. You play roulette, wait till the ball stops moving, then find value in that number. Don't place the bet before. 
So these are big ideas as best efforts, which is drives the internet. We just we want somebody not to be perverse, just do their best to get the package through, and we'll take it from there. And we've got to discover what works. So close by saying we've got to seize the opportunities, not just today, but the opportunities. So there's more on my website. Any, and nobody got up the, anybody got up their barcode readers? They could were they able to resist? Somehow, whenever I see a QR code, I feel obliged to look at it. And those of you going to Globecom, I'm viewing this as a practice for the talk I'm going to give at Globecom. Actually, two talks. One is going to be a three-hour where I go into more detail about this and the opportunities. And the other is going to be a panel discussion entitled The Internet versus Telecom. And I hope it's commercial, but Vince Surf and Dave Farber are going to be on the panel. And they might agree with me, which would take away much of the fun. But. So, 45 min 46 minutes to 35 seconds. Went over a little, but... So, are there questions? A pointer? A pointer. Okay, blind people. Is it green or blue? It's red. Red. I want to blind people blind people in the audience so they ask all the questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, oh, well, it, 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 there is actually, well, the software, some drives designed for that. But yes, that's, with the right pattern, you can do all sorts of refraction patterns and things. True. Oh, okay. I know. Oh, that's interesting because I know that, um, which is the company, uh, Light On, has a DVD engraver, but that's on D DVD. But if you can do metal, that's even more interesting. See, there are opportunities all around us. If you could now, if you can hack, you have to hack the firmware a little, I presume. Yes. So, about ten years ago, uh, there was a, a movement for open Wi-Fi content. Yes. Uh, where people were encouraged to share their personal connections at home, and there was a lot of talk about community Wi-Fi networks and you know, things like this. And I think because of uh, the liability uh, situation. Uh, where network operators, including people at home, are held responsible for what happens on the network rather than the network users. Uh, everybody shut down the uh, It's actually not quite, that's not quite sorry. Now, I, d I have violated my terms of service many times. <laughs> yeah, we all have. Uh, uh, and I encourage it as a your civic responsibility. Because you remember you were not allowed to, to run multiple, uh, and they try to stamp out running multiple devices on your network. You're supposed to pay for each computer, just like cell phones. Uh, you are not allowed to run a server, even if all the, even if Verizon itself sold a voice system, which basically ran a server on your machine. So yes, there are all these things. Uh, the Wi-Fi locking, it, there are two points. One is locking down is for really the bubble baby problem. That a lot of the internal systems just aren't set up to be safe. The liability in the U.S. has not been established. In some countries it is. But I think it's much less of an issue. Um, and in fact, uh, most access points, my Draytech, for example, can support the five things you can open as multiple net, you know, uh, SSIDs. And a lot of it can be flashed to do that. So the real re reason that it's not happening is there's no incentive. Is that unless you have sufficiently dense, co dense coverage to assume ambient connectivity, you don't notice an effect, yeah, I have access points, but who's going to be walking past my house with a laptop? Those who care are going to have a cell phone. They're not going to need my access point. So the real issue is that this wide geographic coverage is great for sitting down in the park and maybe getting on the web. But this is why I want to take the dense coverage. In an apartment house, you assume you can do it so you can start to do connected devices. So, um, uh, so as much as I would like to have everybody have the open access point, we're not, we've, we've, we've wasted billions and billions on all the cellular crap that uh, you know, it's amazing, you know, that we can get it to work anyway, but we have. So use that. So the real focus should be on dense coverage and building out from there to shift the model, not just, more, more, you know, more access points. This is why I don't get so much excited about wide area in the cities, but as far as I know, nobody uses it. I mean, I, I like the idea, but if you want to give the poor access, the digital divide, we we'll also try that. I think we can basically convince them. Didn't make sense. There was no model for it. Instead, teach people how to share an access point. The Dray Tech with five, where you could flash a cheaper one, 
you put that in the house and let everybody teach everybody to share it. They can get connected now for one fifth the cost and for a small fraction of what it would take to maintain a Wi Fi system that reaches into the sub basement. It's the same problem, by the way, diaspora, which is trying to compete with Facebook by cloud sourcing. The problem is you need a sense, you need stakeholders. Facebook is a big stakeholder. It's harder to get, you know, if you need donations, it's harder to be a sustainable model. Because that's not, okay, you asked about authentication versus privacy. I'm saying that's not a network function. Now, we have an anomaly because of what I call the bubble baby network. So we have systems within home networks overly exposed. You look at Microsoft's firewall rules for home group, and they're scary. They're so complex. So it's a very bad model. Now, Andre, people know about Andre Maginot? Okay, Andre Maginot put a wall around France to protect it from the Germans. What? Yeah, the defense wall around France. Now, how well did that work? Not at all. Well, it actually, it probably was poor Andre Maginot. He actually understood you needed an army, and this was just a temporary little thing to just annoy the Germans. It wasn't really going to defend the country. But then he made a fatal mistake. He died. And the politician said, we have a wall. We're done. So we really, this is why we need a lot of research of new trust models. Uh, and some of the virtual networking stuff, I hate the term, you have trust communities within. So we have, really have to get past this bubble. When I first did the design, my argument was IPv4 is a lost cause. But v6 should all be encrypted. Since then I've decided v6 doesn't solve the problem, because it doesn't give you relationship identifiers and all that, but that's a different discussion. But we really have to start by saying, okay, antique stuff, protect it from the world. But we really have to start thinking about sort of the authentication, security, trust models in this new world. When I gave one of my printers a V6 address, I discovered the entire world can access it. Oops. And you can't have name passwords. So this is where, instead of wasting money on genie research, we should really be researching these new trust models. So you don't have to try to lock things down. So I acknowledge in this ambient connectivity model, you might still have devices on a special network. But Verizon should be smart enough that the Fios TV control should not have to be on that network. It should be reachable from everywhere. As long as other people can't watch the, the uh, trash you watch on TV. That's your private information. Much more than your medical. So people, I, I, look, I've got to say, there's a social mode, mode of who. There are people who want to share what they watch, not embarrassed to watch TV. You do each his own. Quest, other questions? Disagreements? Anybody believe in interference? Okay. Either I board people, what? Okay. Yeah. The, uh, well, it turns out it doesn't work in practice. This is why the Japanese say hi. But the way you say yes is it, the way you say no is to say yes and don't mean it. Otherwise, you lose your head. There's a good story in the New Yorker about why we have anonymous ballots. It used to be considered su uh, suspect. To want to not let people know who you're voting for. And sometime in the 19th century, I sort of figured out that there's enough thugs and people out there that maybe a secret ballot is a good idea. But we do have to rethink what we mean by privacy, um, you know, in this new world. Uh, because our, our naive assumptions don't necessarily apply. So we have public persona, private persona, different for each environment because meaning comes from context. So the idea that what you do could be judged by everybody without context. I mean, nothing's wrong, you know, trying a little marijuana in the 70s. It isn't now, but at least then it was much more open. Yet it'll keep you off the Supreme Court forever. You know, we've only, I mean, you can be president, yes, but you can't get on the Supreme Court. So uh, 
we can't abandon, you know, it's hard to abandon privacy, but we do have to rethink it. Uh, no, it's the opposite. If you can't trust identification, you're safer. Obfuscation is what keeps it private. If you can't be sure it's you, change your name to John Smith, you probably have more privacy than anything else you do. Or the Chinese equivalent. Yes? In Japan, it's a popular idea to talk about so called commodity demand. Very cheap, if not free, public provided, but very slow internet. Uh, and people have talked about this both as sort of provide reasons for like robustness reasons, but also that devices can sort of send a trickle. Yes. Okay. Okay. The, 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 okay. Here's the problem. Uh, it's a good idea. I proposed IP 911. Say, so you, you have enough, a couple of kilobits for emergency, tra you know, messages to go through and all of this. Problem you have is value does not correlate with the number of bits. You start to see all the valuable application going to there. You care less, you, you need less. It doesn't, and, and you get cleverness of Skype, compressing voice. People just do text, so they won't need voice as much. So it turns out it's hard to limit the internet connect connectivity enough to support that. So I encourage this as a Trojan horse. I'd like to see cities, I think Brookline, I'd like to try what Brookline has. To assume you have connectivity without authentication, without all the stuff, some level, and discover what you can do with it. I mean, think, uh, uh, you know, a medical mind is a great thing. If you can assume kilobits everywhere that you can extend, you can start to do all sorts of new devices and things. So I'd like to encourage that. But I haven't had a chance. I mean, great if Newton has it. So, but that's, but that's the real problem you have is it's hard to mix two models and get the, but once a city gets the idea of doing that, why stop there? They've now got the idea that the city is providing this infrastructure. They can do megabits for basically essentially nothing more. So it's a good idea, a good talking point, but by the time you get, go through trouble implementing, I think you'll discover you might as well go all the way. Yeah, we need to just do a quick head count of the attendees here in the room who are IEEE members and who are not IEEE members. Can we start with uh, yeah, you or, So you want people who are both members and not members? We need a number for each category. Okay, so it's not logical and. <laughs> um, what I'll really do is I'll just see which is a smaller number because I count. No, I'm saying. No, but. Uh, How about the non? Who here is not a member of the IEEE? Okay, that's the number of that. Who is not a member of the people who are not a member? No. Okay. So either it made too much sense or it didn't make any sense. Either it made too much